Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Damage Report. We're coming off a pretty big night and just the first of several in this week. Last night we had live coverage of what passes for an Iowa caucus these days. Tonight, the State of the Union with what passes for a president these days. And of course, later on in the week, we're gonna be ending with the New Hampshire debate. And I can think of a few things I'd like to ask the candidates coming out of Monday. But anyway, look, we are gonna talk a little bit about the Iowa caucus. Later on, Jordan Ewell, progressive activist, is gonna be joining us as he does every other week. We're gonna be breaking down some of the big news of the day about the caucus. Also, Nina Turner referred to Mike Bloomberg as an oligarch and MSNBC lost it. So we're gonna have some fun with that. We're gonna be closing out the show with a caucus goers realization of a fairly fundamental fact about Pete Buttigieg that really made me angry. And so it's gonna be the rare defense of Pete Buttigieg in an entire block of our show. But before we get to all of that in just a little bit, Ezra Klein, founder of Vox, you know, podcast host, and also the author of Why We're Polarized, is going to be joining us in the studio. A pretty important topic to understand, and so hopefully we're going to learn something as we delve into that book with Ezra in just a little bit. But before we get to all of that, let's start off with some weird news. Apparently, during the Super Bowl festivities, Donald Trump decided to have a little bit of fun while the national anthem was going on. Take a look. Okay, so really fast, in case you couldn't make out what was happening, and you probably couldn't because it looks like it was filmed on a Motorola Razor. So the national anthem is going on, and he's he's you know he's orchestrating it, and he's he's pointing at people a couple times, and then as it's getting near the end, he tires of standing and decides to sit down prematurely. Now look. I'm not gonna talk about this for very long. I understand, as you probably understand, that this is not news, it's not the most important thing that happens in the world. But more importantly, because I think, especially if you are a you you watch the show regularly, I have a feeling you probably already understand everything about this. You understand what you just saw, you understand probably what I'm going to say about it. And yet, just briefly, like the whole Kaepernick thing. It was even faker than it seemed. Like it would be one thing if what the right had was a weird attachment to the flag and a need for deference to it and a level of respect and honoring of it that didn't allow for any understanding of protests involving the national anthem. That would be one thing. That's what they implied that they had. And as outsiders, we can look at that and say, well, look, um, Kaepernick and others who are kneeling during the national anthem, they are being incredibly specific over and over saying what it's about and it's not about dishonoring the national anthem. And that was shouted down over and over and I don't care what you say you're protesting, I'm gonna tell you what you're protesting. But all of that wasn't even what was happening because they don't have that attachment. It is an opportunistic thing created in the moment to, uh, to to cause you to not have an interest in and not have any understanding in the protest. But it's not even real, it's not even durable. They don't care about it at all. Trump just made that incredibly clear. The national anthem is going on and uh, everybody around him is you know hand on their heart. I think it's weird traditions like that, I think. A lot of things that humans do that's weirdly ritualistic, I'm not a big fan of, but fine, they're doing it. It's the way they believe they're showing respect. And he's pointing to people and he's sitting down and he's having a little bit of fun. Partially, yes, because he is fundamentally a four year old brat, but much more importantly, because he doesn't care about the national anthem. It is just a song to him. And there isn't gonna be, like Morning Joe was mad about it. You know, a lot of people are recognizing the whole thing of the, the fakeness of how many times he tweeted about Ka- Kaepernick. And you can look, he did it literally dozens of times. He doesn't care about it. The right doesn't care about it. They're not going to be attacking him like they attacked Kaepernick. It's all fake. And that's part of why this, I get, isn't big news. But like, I want there to be something real, something concrete. I believe that I have a value system that is not just totally up in the wind and it just shifts based on every individual thing that happens, every quote that I hear, that there's something concrete. And even for the people who fundamentally disagree with me on politics, 
I will disagree with them, but I want to believe that they have actual values, even values that I will devote entire segments to trying to tear down, that there's something there, something concrete. A weird fetishizing of the flag and the anthem is something at least, but we don't even have that. And that's sort of depressing. Anyway, I get that it's not news, but it frustrated me this morning, and so um, I've inflicted it on you. Anyway, we're gonna take a short break. When we come back, Ezra Klein is gonna join us in studio. We're gonna be talking about his book, Why We're Polarized. Hopefully gonna learn something uh, important about what has been happening in our country over the past few decades after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary and just the right amount of vulgarity the unftr podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows but don't just take my word for it the new york times described unftr as consistently compelling and educational aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school for as the great philosopher yoda once put it you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Over the past few years, it's become clear that things are falling apart. And one of the lenses that we analyze the way it's falling apart, what it means is through polarization. We can see it in social media, we can see it in the changing dynamics of the parties. Um, but how did we get to where we're at and what comes next? Uh, we're gonna have a great conversation. I'm so excited, Ezra Klein in studio, uh, founder of Vox, uh, host of your podcast, but also author of Why We're Polarized. And so I'm hoping to learn something. Before we get to the why though, like I said in the intro, polarization, the fact that we have these tribes that have developed, it can mean a lot of different things. So when you say that we're polarized, what way are you using that yeah, term? I really appreciate, How are you measuring I appreciate it? you asking this because we use the word polarized really poorly and imprecisely. Mm -hmm. And often it just means in Washington it's like bad or people are arguing. We've we're always mean. had arguments that <laughs> were mean. No, what I mean is simply this. We are separating out into two poles. Things are sorted across two poles. They're not split between them. And in particular, what I'm talking about here is party polarization. How mm -hmm. much our demographics, our ideologies, our disputes layer on top of party. At different times in American politics, we have been very, very, very divided. Mm -hmm. But those divisions have not mapped onto parties. So take the Civil Rights Act itself, which was a very bipartisan bill. It had a higher proportion of Republicans in Congress vote for mm -hmm. it than Democrats, which is an amazing thing to think, right? That mm -hmm. you had something that divisive in the society that had so little actual party division, even as it was tearing the country apart in its own ways. Mm -hmm. It is that moment actually that begins the resorting of the parties because they had been split very much by racial opinions. And so now we have a tremendous amount of our divisions layering on top of our actual party system, which turns American politics from a mechanism of when it's doing it well, compromise, mm -hmm. and doing it poorly, suppression, which I think we should talk about, to a, a mechanism of conflict escalation. Because mm -hmm. it takes conflicts that are happening in the country and then escalates them into political conflict as well. So before we started this uh, this interview, we were talking a little bit about the impeachment trial that's going on. And we had you know the Republican senators almost universally were 100% supportive of Trump. Um, even where there were a few uh, sort of outliers, it was only in maybe we should have witnesses. Um, do you think that that is the product of this sort of polarization that 
that they 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 need Trump to support them in case of some sort of you know like primary challenge, but also they have no real reason to believe that their base is going to turn on them for not being interested in what actually happened with the yeah, Ukraine and it, scandal and absolutely like and it's more than that right that if Donald if they came together with the Democrats and said mm-hmm. you know what what Donald Trump did was wrong there are ways that we are we permit people to act in elections and this goes beyond that they know or they at least believe they know that by admitting that and they all supported Donald Trump and voted with him and voted for him that it would be very very bad for the Republican Party in the next election it would mm-hmm. be a reaping and so they don't have an incentive to hold the president accountable look when you go back to Watergate Richard Nixon he's never he's not impeached mm-hmm. he's not impeached even by the house there isn't a vote what happens is the house Republican leader and two Republican senators, Barry Goldwater and John Hodges, I think it was, they go to Nixon and they say, your party is not gonna stay with you here. Mm-hmm. Like if this goes to a vote, you will lose and you will lose because Republicans, by the way, again, including the Republican House leader yeah. will vote against you. It's amazing. And that's how Nixon goes down. If it happened today, if Watergate happened today, does anybody think he wouldn't survive? And mm-hmm. if he wouldn't survive, right? that's part of the deep American mythology that our political system is self-correcting. Mm-hmm. If Richard Nixon would survive today, so we actually don't have this capacity to be self-correcting in the face of political corruption, what does that actually say about how our political system is working or much more to the point not working? Yeah. The big point of the book is that polarization itself isn't a problem. It's mm-hmm. polarization interacting with a political system that is not designed to work amidst polarization yeah. that creates big problems. Yeah, and especially a system that I think a lot of people have had it made very clear for them over the past few years how much of the way our system worked was not codified in the Constitution or even in federal regulations, laws, all of that. It was very normal and tradition based and those are only as durable as the people surrounding them allow them to be. And, and was, a lot of that has fallen by the wayside. And it was wrong. I mean, I admire the founding fathers wisdom in a lot of different dimensions, but they mm. built a system that they did not believe would have political parties. This is mm-hmm. the founding structure problem. Want it. They didn't want it. They didn't want them. Then they of course created a couple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they 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 reversed on that very quickly. And one thing you see in that is that while people don't like political parties, we don't like them now. We didn't like them then. If you go back to Washington's uh, farewell address, he talks about the the dangers of political parties. In a speech, it is very much one political party attacking another political party. Mm-hmm. People don't want them, but they are natural parts of systems that are designed the way ours are designed. And so in other places where you have a system that is okay working with them, a political mm-hmm. party wins power and that gives them the capacity to govern. What our system does is expect there isn't gonna be political parties. So even when a group wins power, they often don't have the capacity to govern because there mm-hmm. isn't an expectation you would have divided government between branches in the way we do. The branches might compete with each other, but you wouldn't have parties cooperating across branches or competing mm-hmm. across branches. That's what you see here. Impeachment is meant to be the branches holding each other accountable. Instead, what you have is the Republican Party has a White House and they have the Senate. They are cooperating across those branches of government as opposed to Congress, of which the Senate yeah. is of course part, working to hold in an, in an ambition checking ambition way, working to hold the president yeah. accountable. So, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the system because we, we have this interesting distribution of power right now where the, the, the branch of government, the sub branch that is the most sort of explicitly democratic Democratic, run by popular vote now, all that sort of thing, um, is currently held by the Democrats. But the the White House, the Senate, and because of the White House and the Senate, the Supreme Court, the ones that that have sort of baked into the system inequity in a lot of different ways are held by Republicans. So how does that interact with some of the other things that you're talking about in this book when uh, a greater and greater percentage of the population is living in fewer and fewer states, mm-hmm. and uh, that is, you know, that's affecting the distribution of power in the Senate and with the Electoral College in the, the pre- for the presidency as well. Poorly. So I want to push on one thing, which is the House is not popular vote. The House mm-hmm. is gerrymandering its geography, and if yes. Democrats had won the popular vote there by plus one or plus two in 2018, they would not have the gavel. So yes. we're in a situation where it is entirely possible for mm-hmm. Democrats to win the popular vote at the House, at the Senate, and the White House level, not win majority power in or just power in mm-hmm. any of them. And because of that, the Supreme Court, of course. So right now, Mitch McConnell, Republicans won uh, fewer votes over the past three Senate cycles. And Democrats, Mm -hmm. they've got the gavel there. They won, of course, three million fewer votes for the White House. And because of that, they they nevertheless got the um, White House. And they have the Supreme Court. This is a way- Because of those others. Because of those others. This is a way the parties are structurally different. And I think it's under noticed. Republicans have a path to power that is built on electoral uh, popular vote minorities. Mm -hmm. And Democrats only have a path to power that requires not just them to get a majority, but a pretty big majority. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a new study on the Electoral College. It shows, I find this actually a little terrifying. Republicans should be expected to win 65% of presidential elections in which Democrats narrowly win the popular vote, Mm -hmm. 65%. And so we're in a system right now where Democrats have to win center right voters, just as you, however you define them, voters who are just like 
a little bit to the right of the median voter because that is the only way for them to win enough geographic power to mm-hmm. win the way our system uh, offers power. Republicans are able to run the strategy they're running only because they can run it based on um, minorities of the popular vote. So one of my arguments in the book is that democracy itself is disciplining. It forces you to speak to a wider percentage of the population, mm-hmm. forces you to take seriously what people want and, and, and what they need. Democrats still have to do that. Republicans increasingly do not. And one of the ways they're responding to that is turning against Against democracy itself. There are a lot of Republican mm-hmm. efforts at state levels and even at national levels, a lot of Supreme Court decisions that are meant to actually change who is able to vote, what power centers are able to express themselves. That's pretty dangerous when the locus of competition becomes not who has a more appealing agenda mm-hmm. to most people, but actually who is has the power to decide who is going to vote and how much their votes are going to count. So, so I want to turn now to. I mean, I don't want to spoil everything, but um, you There's know, a how do huge we, twist ending in this book? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, uh, Trump was Hillary all along. <laughs> um, so let, let's turn now to some potential solutions. Um, we have a system that has some issues. Those issues are getting worse over time. How do you fix them? But in particular, what sorts of uh, solutions or reforms can you put into place in a context where? Uh, power is already being held by people who got in thanks to that system, and there's a 65% chance that they could retain that. You know, all it's being. Even. I want to be very clear. I am not here to give you hope. Oh, great! This okay. is not a hopeful book. Okay, well, if this, this is, is the theme a- of the show. Honestly, <laughs> we rarely this do. This is a description of how a system is working. The first mm-hmm. step to fixing anything, if we're going to fix it, is that we have to understand the actual way it works. Why it is functioning the way it does. Why polarization is breaking it. So. First and foremost, like I do not want people to read this book for solutions mm-hmm. because I don't believe the solutions I put out in this book are going to happen. What I believe is that the analysis of how the system is structured and why it is working the way it is is correct. The problem with getting any of like my big picture structural solutions done, like proportional vote and mm-hmm. in instant runoff voting and campaign finance reform and get rid of the electoral college and get rid of the filibuster, and I got I got my hey, whole fantasy I got my whole fantasy football at how I would reconstruct mm-hmm. American politics. If there was a capability to pass things like that. Then the problem I'm actually trying to solve probably wouldn't be a problem at all, which is that polarization makes the system ungovernable. You need mm-hmm. very high levels of uh, compromise and even consensus across the parties to get big things done in American politics, given the structure of the system. Yeah. That makes it very hard to do the kinds of things I'm talking about. I think we might see the system change over the next 10, 15, 20 years because of demographic change, or it could mm-hmm. change in a darker way because of disenfranchisement. So you could see different things happening here that will change the underlying analysis. I think we should democratize the system. I think we should bomb-proof it against things like the debt ceiling. I think there are, and I think there's an argument for doing things like balancing the party's power in certain places. You can mm-hmm. imagine that, say, in the Supreme Court by moving to term limits or something else. Mm-hmm. But the problem is you can't pass anything because of polarization. So mm-hmm. at the very least, I will say one thing I am trying to do is get. I would like it to be all parties, but Democrats in particular, to recognize that if they don't take system reform seriously, if they don't mm-hmm. take making it possible to pass policy, making it possible for democratic, small d democratic majorities to express themselves and govern, the whole rest of their agenda, whether it's Medicare for all or it's the moderates or whatever, is not going to work. Yeah. So they need to take democracy itself as the top priority. You know, it's interesting because I was that was sort of going to be my next question. Um, I believe that by watching the behavior of Donald Trump, but also Mitch McConnell, I think they sort of get fundamentally what has changed, what's happening, all of that. Do you believe that the Democratic leadership understands the situation that they're in? Do they get this turn away from democracy in a lot of different ways that the Republican Party has taken? For me, we might disagree on some things politically. It feels like they are still trying to, in this election, play ball by the rules of 15, 20 years ago. Do you believe that they fundamentally understand how things are changing? I think it depends who you're looking at. I mm-hmm. think some understand it much better than others. I think, say, Joe Biden is very much trying to play ball by the rules of 15 to 20 years ago. He came of age in a depolarized Senate when he talks mm-hmm. about these you know, compromises he made with the segregation of senators. Mm-hmm. He's very much talking about that mid-century you know, Dixiecrats and sort of conservatives in the Democratic Party Senate. That is his emotional baseline of how American there politics There were liberal work. Republicans there at that time. There were liberal Republicans you could work with. It was pretty different. Now, he's not as far to that side. I mean, he was there during the Obama administration. He knows it doesn't quite work that way. But he fundamentally has a, a politics of restorationist epiphany, right? Mm-hmm. He's going to get elected. Republicans, as he said, will have some kind of epiphany, and they'll work with him in a way that they haven't been until now. Um, on the other side, I think you'll see Bernie Sanders similarly has a politics of epiphany, but it comes out of political revolution. It comes out of like the country will see that the democratic socialist agenda is what they want. But the problem there, where I do believe actually a lot of those ideas are very popular, is that 
Popular majorities are not able to express themselves into power. You can get 60% of the country mm-hmm. on the side of something, say gun control, and not get anywhere with it. So mm-hmm. I think you still need a lot, a lot of this systemic reform. There are very few Democrats, liberal, not liberal, moderate, whatever it is, very few Democrats I talk to in the Senate who, or anywhere, who recognize that they have to do political reform first and are willing mm-hmm. to do that. Um, a couple, uh, Elizabeth Warren has been pretty out front on this. She's pushed pretty hard. She sees it more around corruption, but she has in a way the others have not. She's come out for getting rid of the filibuster, getting rid of the electoral college, as some of the others have. But it's really not about whether or not you say those words. It is about whether you prioritize it. You're yeah. gonna have to get into power and make this your first thing, spend your political capital here, and be willing to hear the media attacking you, be willing to hear people say, "Oh, democracy itself would be a power mm-hmm. grab, which I think is deeply unfair. True, but like a very good just rule of thumb, which candidate is going to come in and do what we should have done a long time ago because it is the right thing to do and make DC and Puerto Rico states? You can do that just straightforwardly, uh, but you have to decide to do it first, or you're not gonna have the political capital to do it ever. Yeah, and look, HR1 was all focused around um, Mm -hmm. not so much structural, but ethics, corruption, and also some voting reform. And that was a kind of important thing. Yes, and so hopefully the field is ready to be seated. But to pass that in the Senate, they would have to get rid of the filibuster. Yeah, that's a that's So that's the thing, the first thing you have to do in the Senate, it's why I focus on the Senate, is even just passing through majority vote in through that, you have to get rid of the filibuster. If you don't Mm -hmm. get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, there is no progressive agenda that will pass, it is not possible. Okay, uh, I would love to have a full conversation about that and some of the implications of that. But I do want to let people know where uh, they can see where your book tour is going soon. So I believe we have a graphic we can bring up showing some of the, the upcoming cities. Um, you're uh, in February, uh, Feb- well, it's February right now. Uh, you're in LA right now, but you're also gonna be traveling to San Francisco and you can see there. Feel free to pause this uh, on YouTube and you can see a number of different locations you're gonna be traveling around. Um, you know, fascinating book, and I and I hope that Democratic leadership uh, takes some of the lessons seriously. Thank you very uh, much. We're in a special time, a dark time, uh, but thank you, Ezra. Great Appreciate to have you here. Uh, everybody at home, uh, progressive activist Jordan Yule is going to be joining us on the other side to talk about the Iowa caucuses, some other big news of the day. So stick around after this. It's the first rule, win Iowa, because nine out of 11 Democratic presidential candidates who won Iowa won the whole, won the nomination. So there you have Chris Matthews sort of laying out one of his rules in Iowa. I would add a follow up rule, have apps that work, that would be nice. It was obviously a mess and we're gonna talk about multiple aspects of this. I do wanna start off though with what we believe we know about the rankings and joining us now to discuss that and more, progressive activist Jordan Yule, welcome back to the show. John, thank you for having me. Uh, great to have you here. So you saw there uh, in that little uh, uh, introductory video, uh, first rule, win Iowa. We don't know for sure. We've only seen some early numbers put out by uh, the Bernie campaign, by the Buttigieg campaign. Uh, but it looks so far like Bernie might have won. Uh, what's your reaction to that, but in general, the experience we had last night? Yeah, early reports uh, you know, are uncertain. They were at this point, which is like it's, like 130 on the East Coast on Tuesday. We're expecting results maybe by five o'clock. It really just shows kind of what a mess this whole thing is. But because the caucus process is so just convoluted, it looks like the Bernie campaign smartly had its its precinct goers and precinct captains report data to them so they could also kind of do their own level of validation. And last night they reported data about 40% of precincts showing that they were in the lead, kind of it, it, it matches what we had kind of expected with polling going into this. Uh, but really, this just shows that like the Iowa caucus process is such a mess and has outsized influence over uh, presidential politics and national politics. And this is what if, do we have to ask ourselves: Is this really what we want? Uh, being like the starting point. Uh, for one of the most important national decisions we collectively make, yeah. uh, I would argue uh, maybe we re- reconsider. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know exactly what the system should be. I can only hope that it features as many coin flips as the current system. Um, but anyway, uh, so look, it was a disaster. I think we agree there. We don't know for sure, but it looks like um, one person that it was a particular disaster for might have been Joe Biden. Here's a little bit more of Chris Matthew, Matthews uh, talking about that. I think we got a lot more game ahead of us, a lot more game ahead of us with Bernie uh, coming out really strong. I believe the first couple contests staying strong for a while. Uh, Biden, I don't know if he's going to make it. We'll see tonight if he makes it on. They used to say three tickets out of Iowa. We'll Mm -hmm. see. I think there'll be three or four maybe. We'll see. 
Yeah, maybe one extra ticket for Biden, but I did want to give you a little bit of breaking news. CNN's John King is apparently reporting that the Biden campaign is looking into seeking a court injunction to halt this afternoon's release of the Iowa caucus results. And it is believed that in the preliminary numbers we've seen that Biden did not do particularly well. If he does this, if he tries to legally block the public reporting of the caucus results, what do you think that means? What effect will that have? Well, uh, John, if I was coming out of Iowa in first place, the last thing I would want would be to shut down the public release of the results in court. So I mean, that decision just has to show like they're expecting something really bad. They want to delay this as long as possible uh, because then that blunts the momentum for whoever the 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 winner is. Um, you know, a lot of people are kind of reading into this, whether this means like it's just like overall doom and despair for the Biden campaign. I don't necessarily think so. There's a ton of southern states that, you know, Biden is, you know, poised to do really well in. Uh, he's running on name recognition. He's running on uh, the Obama uh, tenure. Um, he, he's just running an old Democratic establishment campaign. But because of that, that really speaks to why they didn't do well in Iowa. It's just old, the old guard just kind of doing the same old stuff, running on name recognition, not really tapping into the grassroots uh, progressive activist culture and spirit that we saw like the Sanders campaign tap into, which likely led to a really good result for them. Yeah, Um, look, I think that Biden challenging the credibility of the results, not just the process, which we all agree the process was a mess, but trying to imply that there's something fundamentally wrong with the final results. I don't like that. I think that the comparisons to Donald Trump of any politician get thrown around too casually. But this is the sort of thing that Donald Trump would do if he was coming in fourth in a you know a caucus or something like that. I don't like to see it. But we had another version of that last night where before, long before the results came out, Buttigieg gave a speech where he said, so we don't know all the results, but we know by the time it's all said and done, Iowa, you have shocked the nation. He said an improbable hope became an undeniable reality and said that they would be going to New Hampshire victorious. So that's different than the legal strategy of Biden, but still seemed to imply before we know that he knew that he had won. What did you make of that tack in his speech last night? I mean, a lot of people are calling this a smart political move. I don't really buy into any of that. It's just for him, if he wants to posture it as this is an overall win because maybe they came in second and they were expected to do it a little bit better based on the latest polling. Sure, okay, whatever. It's just he's really trying to blunt the momentum from the Sanders campaign. Like, no one really wants Sanders to come out with a huge news cycle declaring him the victory, the victor. The fundraising that comes with that, the momentum that comes with that. Everyone was trying to. To attach themselves, that's why Biden is trying to challenge us in court. That's why Pete took credit. That's why the people are questioning the legitimacy. And I don't think the comparisons to Trump are are unfair on the legitimacy point because that's literally what he said he was planning to do if Clinton beat him in 2016. So I mean, it's not too far fetched. Like, I mean, there can be comparisons and parallels if the behavior matches, which in Biden's case it does. And uh, with Buttigieg, let's just bear in mind, like. Uh, like Biden, whatever he's doing is with the potential understanding that he might have come in fourth. Buttigieg looks like he's going to be in second, possibly even first. We honestly don't know. He did not have a terrible night. And that's why perhaps I'm a little bit more critical of the messaging around it. But that's not to say, like I know some people will think he claimed victory, that's the same as victory. It, it you know, it's awful in that way. I don't necessarily think so. I, I already see the pushback against his speech last night in the media. I want to show you one or two videos. Here was him sort of not wanting to answer questions about that early call. Mayor Buttigieg, was it yeah. premature to declare a victory How do you feel Iowa about Iowa? Night? How do you feel? You said victorious last night. Do you think that's too early or do you feel like, feel like your numbers are going well? Okay, so he's smiling, but he doesn't want to actually say anything. Um, I, I know that some people might think, and I want to be fair to that position, that we're being too critical. That he didn't say he won, and that's fair. He did not say that. What the particular way that he he put out that statement in the context of the other speeches that you saw? What, what do you think about it? I mean, the, the, even an honest reading would would take away that he claims he won. I mean, this is like a rat move by by just like you know the rat mode kind of guy. He this is just. A slimy, just purely political animal 
uh, type of ploy to to glom onto this and take credit for something he doesn't know that he he has. Uh, again, it's to try to mitigate any type of momentum that Sanders might have. Uh, and that he can't even answer for it today shows that maybe he's starting to regret it because we don't have the results. Uh, they claimed last night that they had 70% of precincts reporting uh, to their own campaign that shows them ahead. Uh, they provided no evidence of that. They just said it, which, you know, politicians lie all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it remains to be seen, but this is like a total rat move. And look, and I want to be fair in, in a couple different ways. One, he could end up winning. Many people will be watching this later on the day on YouTube. The results will be already out. Maybe he won. And also, it is possible that he had lines written and he just he just went with it and didn't think about the implications, that is fair. But I would say then when people are asking you questions the next day, I think you have to explain yourself. He, he, didn't, he chose not to there. We have one more video where he's going to try to finesse the whole victorious thing. And let's see how, what we think about this. We heard you say we're going on to New Hampshire victorious, but how can you do that when the official results are not in? Shouldn't you wait? Well, we... We have the results from our organization, and if you look at what we were able to do, uh, what happened last night, the fact that uh, this campaign was able to gather support in urban, suburban, and rural areas alike, in counties that Hillary Clinton won, counties that Donald Trump won, uh, we are, are thrilled and, and absolutely consider that a victory. Okay, um, I, I have no doubt that he got some supporters in different sort of geographic areas. I would argue that probably all the candidates did. Um, is that a sufficient? response to the critiques from a good question, by the way, uh, on CBS this morning. Yeah, that was a great question, terrible answer. <coughs> I mean, that is like the quintessential, like just hollow, uh, just dodging the question type of answer. Uh, yeah, sure, you got support in, in different areas. So did everybody else. That doesn't make anyone else winners. It's just, he, they're trying to walk it back now. He's dodging the question. He's kind of a spineless little weasel in politics, uh, kind of tired of it, honestly. The guy is just, he'll say and do anything to get ahead. Uh, this is a, a clear, like clear-cut example of that. Yeah, wow. You know, from what you're saying, I, I would never have believed that you were actually a Buttigieg supporter. But um, you know, we appreciate the perspective. <laughs> anyway, come on, man. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, so we're gonna have more with Jordan uh, after this break. Everybody, stick around. We should be ashamed of that as Americans, people who believe in democracy, that the oligarchs, if you have more money, you can buy your way. Now, but to your point. You think Mike we, Bloomberg's an oligarch? You, you, Come listen, on. He, he is. So there you have uh, Nina Turner, who's recently been on the show. Uh, I believe correctly identifying Michael Bloomberg as exactly what the term oligarch is intended to, uh, to describe. Um, Jordan Ewell joins us again. What did you make of Nina Turner uh, identifying him in that way? I mean, Bloomberg, by you know every measure, uh, fits the bill for uh, for being an oligarch. He's worth sixty billion dollars. He's one of the biggest political donors in the country on the left. Uh, he just bought his way onto the Democratic stage by bribing the DNC, uh, giving them almost like the max. Uh, and now all of a sudden they changed the rules to let him uh, onto the debate stage. He's buying his way into a presidential race. I don't know if you saw this morning. He's doubling his ad spends now after the, the disarray in Iowa. Uh, he is he is an oligarch. I mean, Bloomberg is what represents like the worst aspects of big money in politics. We should be extremely wary of this guy trying to influence our political process or personal gain. Yeah, yeah, I don't understand what is controversial about this. And we're gonna have some back and forth on MSNBC about this. Uh, if you have an extreme amount of wealth and you are able to turn that into an outsized influence over politics, uh, that's an oligarch. Honestly, like we identify Donald Trump as being, you know, wealthy and, and all of that. There's no comparison between the two. He has 30 to 50 times as much money as Donald Trump. He spent a quarter of a billion dollars and has risen in the polls exclusively based on that. That is the definition. So it shouldn't, like Nina Turner is getting attacked for this. None of that is justified. And I want to give you an example of what she's facing. So uh, there was a panel involving um, her and uh, MSNBC contributor Jason Johnson. Here is Johnson uh, responding to her invocation of the oligarchs. It's not just about a word, it's, it's about, about word. the implications of it. And it's about criticizing the system versus criticizing individuals. Like I said, I wouldn't call Bernie Sanders an oligarch, and he happens to be part of the 1%. 
Okay, so there's two things there. So one is you can criticize the system, don't criticize the individuals as if oligarchy can exist without oligarchs um, as manifestations of it. But then also you saw there, he then turned it on Bernie saying, you work for someone who's part of the 1%. Yeah, uh, you know, just classic disingenuous uh, distraction uh, from Jason there. Comparing uh, a guy who one year uh, in his 70s made $2 million uh, through selling a book to a guy with a literal media empire worth 60 billion. Hey, maybe Jason just doesn't want to bite the hand that feeds. Maybe he's trying to get a job at Bloomberg uh, after he's done where he's at now. Uh, you never know, but you know it's classic manufacturing consent from the corporate media, just falling on the sword for the richest and most privileged among us. You know, some people go into journalism because they want to hold the powerful accountable. Some people want to make them feel flattered and get jobs from them. You know, pick pick your pick your career path. Yeah, and uh, you know, I want to give uh, Nina Turner to a chance to respond to that. So here is a bit of her from that appearance. You know, it's just ironic to me that somebody would defend the wealthiest people in this country over the working people of this country. We need real campaign finance reform to the extent that a mayor Bloomberg can totally finance his campaign. He doesn't have to go out to the people. He doesn't have to build a movement. He doesn't have to talk to people. He can buy his way. It is the same attitude that the elites, maybe Jason likes the word elite over oligarch, but it's the same attitude that the elites had in 1930 against FDR. All of them lined up against him. He said, I welcome your hatred because he was standing up for the people. And that was great, but I also want to read just a bit of a tweet that she put out. So Nina tweeted, I may not have a PhD yet, but I do have the good sense of knowing what makes for oligarchy. Anyone caping for a billionaire with a media company able to buy endless ads and influence party rules halfway through is precisely a perpetuator of the corrupt system, i.e. an oligarch. And thank God that she is talking about this because he it, he's at like 13%, he's tied with Warren, he is spending so much money. And I think that almost everyone for different reasons believes, yeah, 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 that's bad, that's scary, but it's not gonna matter. You know, eventually he's going to, you know, tail off, he's gonna, he's in a crater. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but not necessarily. There's a lot of people that are not paying that much attention to what's going on, and they'll vote for the person whose face they've seen on Facebook ads and YouTube ads a hundred times a day. I don't know, maybe I'm too scared. What do you think, Jordan? No, I think you're exactly right, John. I mean, so much of politics is name recognition, uh, making an impression on people, uh, just just getting your face out there, getting your name out there, and not really, uh, you know, running on anything. Uh, they call people who vote like that based on those things low information voters. Uh, that's who Bloomberg is trying to sway. Whether or not that's a successful strategy in the long run remains to be seen. Yeah. But that's what he's trying to do. Uh, but again, it just really speaks to the kind of the corrupt nature of the DNC, that they were willing to rewrite their rules uh, just to let this guy on the debate stage. It's just, it's just, it's absurd, patently yeah. absurd, and we should condemn him, condemn it widely. Yeah, I, I wanna get your, your brief reaction to this. Coming out of the experience of last night, as it was developing, a lot of people, I, I think, rightfully thought, okay, clearly we need reform to the system. We need to make it easier to vote and for our elections to run smoothly. Not everyone had that same sort of reaction. Here's a bit of Ben Shapiro believing that it is still far too easy for people to vote. The, the basic idea that you should be able to have basic, you know, a basic, not as you say, fake poll test, literacy test designed to exclude black people or something. The idea that you'd have to have like a basic knowledge of America's constitution, for example, to vote. I don't see that as a, as a horrible idea. I really don't. I mean, it, it seems to me that that having people, you know, the the system that we have right now, which is you pick up a bunch of people at at a bus stop and you bring them to a voting place, which is really what's happening in a lot of local elections, particularly that that is somehow beneficial to democracy. I find bizarre. It's one of the reasons why I think that the the notion that you should be able to vote online, that making voting easier is deeply important. I don't agree with that. I mean, I think that you should actually have to jump through the hoop of having to take the time and effort to vote because. If you're not willing to do that, then why should I take your vote as seriously as somebody who is willing to take voting seriously? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's too easy. I mean, you could just bus people there and like a citizen can then cast a vote after someone else drove them. Why should you be allowed to vote unless you have like a driver's license, your own car? He almost said literacy test in a positive sense, then corrected himself because he realized that was a little bit too on the nose. Yeah, but then he kind of goes on to argue for just you know literacy tests in a different form. Um, ben Shapiro is just one, of, just one of the most like insidious 
uh, political commentators. He he's made his career out of doing like windmill dunks on like college freshmen as a guy with a law degree. You know, just likes to punch down and pick on people who aren't as educated to make himself you know feel better, feel smarter, whatever. And he's kind of conned a lot of people into thinking he's some you know boy intelligentsia. Uh, this is kind of just a weak argument and has like roots in racism, which when you look at Ben Shapiro's past writing for uh, Breitbart, you know, not too surprising. It's yeah. a site that had a, a black crime tag on stories, black on black crime tag on stories. He's, uh, you know, criticized just rap, which, you know, clearly had, if you read his writing, clearly had racial animus uh, intertwined in his writing. The guy is just, just, just terribly racist. And even if the, the, the bus stop example, it, it just, that he chose that instead of what we all know happens all the time at nursing homes where they just bus senior citizens to the polls. Notice that wasn't his example. Yeah. And why is that? Like who takes buses more than who lives, you know, the, the older upper crust white population that overwhelmingly votes isn't a problem, but it's, you know, it's bus stops. That's really yeah. the problem. It really speaks to uh, how Ben sees that scenario. Yeah, yeah, there, there is a war on democracy, and in this and in only this, he is an enthusiastic soldier. Uh, Jordan Ewell, as always, thank you so much for joining us, really appreciate it. John, thank you for having me. Okay, uh, everybody stick around, one more segment after this. I've got my issues with Pete Buttigieg, I've been very clear about that, disagree with him fundamentally on some issues, also his style. But that's really where I draw the line. But we still live in a country where issues with Pete Buttigieg can take a far darker and older school form. Take a look at this interaction between a caucus goer who supported Pete Buttigieg and one of the Buttigieg caucus precinct captains. Are you saying that he has the same sex partner? He? Yes. Yes, he does. Are you kidding? He's married to him, yes. We need to find out if that's serious. Then I don't want anybody like that in my house. So can I have my card back? I don't know. He signed it. We could go ask. I never knew that. Well, so the whole point of it is, though, he's a human being, right? Just like you and me, and should it really matter? That's what. Well, he better read the Bible. He does, and he says that God doesn't choose a political party. Because why does it say in the Bible that a man should marry a woman then? Well, I totally respect your viewpoint on this. I so totally do. But I think that we were not around. How come this has never been and brought out before? It's, it's common knowledge. I never heard it. Deeply, deeply frustrating on so many different levels. So that, that precinct captain is a Buddhist supporter. I disagree with her on a lot of things. Like my heart goes out to her so much. And there's a lot more of the video. You can track it down. Her trying to get through to this woman and being super un unnecessarily understanding of where this woman is coming from as she continually relitigates her bigotry against Buttigieg. A person who, again, she supported in the caucus until she found out that he was gay, which I will just add on to what the, the captain was saying. Yeah, that was common knowledge at this point, but it's a reminder too that no matter how much we talk about a thing, no matter how much we believe everybody knows this, that's not gonna penetrate to a significant percentage of the population that is going about their regular day. You would think most people would know that, particularly supporters of him, but there are people that don't. And still, people whose choice of politicians to support will come down to, is this person doing something that I think is sinful based on my particular interpretation of the Bible? Like I said in the intro, I, I'm not supporting Pete Buttigieg. I disagree with him on a lot of the policies. I don't like his style. I find him to be kind of dishonest in the way he communicates. A lot of that is driven from my bias. I've already endorsed Bernie Sanders. But in this, Jesus, we still live in a country where a person who they've experienced years of the Trump stuff, seen how the Republicans have been, all of that, it's all so clear. And now they're engaged in the choice of who's gonna replace that and fundamentally share some of the same bigotries and some of the same hatreds and suspicions and fears and xenophobia that supposedly we've all come together to oppose. That is deeply distressing, depressing. Buttigieg and his workers don't deserve literally any of that. We can disagree on so many things, but the idea that someone's sexual choices should determine whether or not they're allowed to inhabit the White House, we should have moved so far past that so long ago. And unfortunately, so far, 
we have not. Okay, anyway, thank you for joining me throughout this episode. It was great for the first time having Ezra Klein in studio. You're gonna definitely wanna take a look at that book because I think there's a lot that we can learn there. And you know, shout out to Jordan Yule for joining us once again. JR joins us on JR Wednesdays tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.